just a nerd, just a music nerd, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I was like school studies in my wife is present yet. Ah, well, that's not what this is. <laughs> so it wouldn't. It would, <laughs> it, there's always. I always have a few people who, who assume that. But in, in music, we call the sheet music the score, okay. right? And studying the score. So if you wanted to go to Forefront's class right now, okay. which I'll, I'll do it again. may be pretty entertaining, I would not be offended whatsoever. So if you just stand up and walk out, don't worry, I won't hate you. Okay. Uh, so we're going to just talk a little bit about. So how many of us are chorus directors? Sort of okay, and you again, we just have that kind of music nerds that are like, let's see what this guy's got, yeah, basically. Okay, well, um, you know, uh, as a, a trained musician, I have two degrees in music my undergraduate degree is in music education, my graduate degree is in, is in conducting. Um, I have had to do amazing amounts of analysis of all sorts of scores. We're not going to necessarily talk about that kind of analysis. We're going to talk about uh, analyzing your music so that it is very, very practical to your rehearsal, right? So a lot of people think this is like things that we need to know for score study. Can you identify chords? Can you identify inversions of chords? Can you identify the quality of chords? You know, can you see where the where the arrangement goes around the circle of fits and things like that? And I would submit that none of that is going to help you whatsoever as a chorus director rehearsing your chorus. There are so many better things to know that this is a dominant seventh chord is really not helpful whatsoever. And how many of your chorus members, when you talk to them and you say, well, you know you're on the root of the chord, and the root of the chord has to be there. I mean, they just kind of glaze over when you start talking music theory to them. So we have to find ways that are going to, to really get all of that important information to our chorus without boring the heck out of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that we have to do, and if anyone's interested in any of this, I'm more than happy to send this to you, but I think if you studied music, much of this would be, would be common knowledge. You have to start, you know, so, I don't know how it is here in Australia, but so many of our choruses in the US will just purchase the music, the sheet music, and the learning track, and give it to the chorus. And start, they start learning it, and then they start directing it, and then they're so far behind, and they wonder, why did I get a 65? I think that the level at which you as a director can study your music and know your music and be a master of the arrangement is the level at which your chorus will be able to score. Okay, so before you do all of that and you find a song and you say, Blue Skies, I want to do Blue Skies, that you rip that song apart and put it back together again before you even purchase the learning tracks and, and, and hand it out to your chorus, okay? And I won't bore you by reading these things because I think a lot of this is common knowledge, but going through the music and identifying all of these things, all of the elements of the text, the overall form of the song, this is probably, as a, as a chorus director, one of the most important things of all is understanding the form of the song because if you understand the form of the song, then you should be able to start at any new section of the song. The first chorus, the second chorus, the bridge, the tag, the verse, the intro, the interlude, wherever that is, so that when you hear a problem and you stop the chorus, you don't have to go all the way back to the beginning of the song to get them into it, right? And can you go even further? Can you break those sections down into even smaller sections? and find ways to get the chorus to start into all of them. We have a lot uh, of uh, repeating sections in barbershop music, okay? In other music, in other world music, so you'll find a lot of through composed music, but in, in barbershop we have so many parts of what we sing that are repetitive. And can you, right from the start, say, here's what's different between this chorus and this chorus. This chorus ends low, this chorus ends high. 
The lyrics in this chorus talk about the girl. The lyrics in this part of the chorus talk about the time, the, the, the relationship. You know, you can break it down in so many different ways. And before I even start any song with my chorus, I explain all of that to them. And every song we have, I have the form written down on the column of the, the, the music so that they know. If I say start from chorus two, and I have a guy who doesn't know anything about music and doesn't know that you call notes quavers in Australia, right? How is he, how the hell is he gonna know what chorus two is? Right, so we have to make sure that we are masters of the form and we know how to get in and out of every section of the chorus. We have to understand the melody. Now, uh, the reason that this is important is because uh, uh, Everything that we do in music, not just barbershop, is just a series of tension and release. That's what almost all music is. And if we think of the melody, again, I'll use this, the song that was kind of overdone in the contest this weekend, uh, The Way You Look Tonight, right? This is a great example of building melodic tension. Bum, bum, ba da 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 So you can feel that pattern, that circling, and building tension until it finally re reaches what? Do, right? Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi, fa, sol, fa, mi, right? Da, da, dee, 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 dum. And then it goes, bum. And then there's just a little flower thing at the end. Da, da, dee, dee, da, da, da. Ending on do again, right? So I mean, that's a clear sense. If you're scoring a 65 and you want to score a 75, you should not just accurately sing, someday when I'm awfully low, when the world is cold, we need someday when the world is cold. Ya da 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 ya da 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 da. Put a score to that. So really understanding the melody, understanding all of the elements of harmony. We have the same uh, uh, same sort of thing. So melody is obviously this way. Harmony is everything that happens this way. So if we think of my wild Irish rose, okay, we have my wild Irish rose, and on rose we have a harmonic embellishment. What harmonic embellishment happens on rose? Well, what's the embellishment that happens? You're, you're right. Yeah, what do you call it? Where the bass goes to the center. What'd you think? Swipe. Yes, exactly right. We have a swipe. It's a harmonic embellishment, right? Where we sing a chord and, and some number of the parts swipe. Okay, now what parts swipe? This is, this is the type of harmonic analysis that I'm saying is incredibly important to dissecting the music and then relaying that to our chorus. So we have a swipe that happens on rows at the end of Wild Irish Rose. How many of the parts swipe? Bass and Barry. Exactly right, bass and Barry. Now, if you, a, a lower scoring performance of that would be my Wild Irish Rose. Now, if we think of that chord, it's a major chord, and then the bass and berry swipe up from root five to five, seven. So we get this chord that goes bum. Okay, does that build tension or release tension? Obviously, we go from a chord with no tension in it whatsoever to the chord with some of the highest tension we can possibly have. Also, if you just look at the chord, it's spread out like this, and then it tightens up like this, okay? Almost all choruses will sing with the top two notes just doing nothing but holding on to their note like they have nowhere else to go, okay? And if you ask that chorus, what are you doing there, leads? You're just holding a note? Their, their answer is going to be, yeah, okay? And that's your score, right? But that lead should really go, my wild Irish rose and sing release, tension, because the basses and baritones are going release, 
tension, okay? So what I go through is I find out where all of those harmonic embellishments are, if it's going from release to tension or from tension to release. And the goal for my chorus is that when one part swipes, everybody swipes, okay? So if one part, if there's a berry echo, it's not a berry echo. Everyone is participating in that echo. The rhythms. Uh, the thing, the quick thing that I'll say about the rhythms is if we're doing a rhythm song, everything has to be driven by rhythm. I think that somebody had said that yesterday in the judges the, the judges talk that, that kicked everything off. When you, when you consider the theme of the song and the, and the song that you're performing is a ry rhythmic theme, there should be nothing more important, not the melody, not the harmony, not the lyrics, nothing more important than the rhythm. If you're doing a song like Paper Moon, say it's only a paper moon. What I would tell the chorus to do is get rid of all of the lyrics, and does the song still survive? Then I'd ask them to let's get rid of the pitches too. Does the song still survive? This is where you see what it'll score. Okay, how artistic it is. If we get rid of the lyrics, does it work? sorts of rules that we need to put in place to guide the listener's ear. 
Many groups will just sing the notes and words as they're written on the page. But for instance, if we have a tenor solo or a bass solo, the rule to making that work is that the other three parts combined must equal the volume of the one part singing the solo. That's really significant. That's asking 75% of the chorus to reduce their volume to 25% combined so that it equals the one part that's singing the solo. And then, when it goes back to four-part homophony, if they go back to that equal volume that they should be doing, there's a power, there is a strength to homophony, and that's what makes it such a hallmark of the barbershop style. So you have to go through and you have to figure out where those textures change, who needs to back off, who needs to sing louder, and when does it change back? And what do those volume relationships have to go to at that point as well? Um, the, the last one that I'll, I'll go in depth on is dynamics. Um, another tool that I will do, especially with a learning track, is I'll, play, I'll have the chorus stand in a big circle. And I'll play the learning track. And I'll have them map out the dynamic plan. Okay? So if, uh, if they're going to sing, uh, part of my heart, I love you. Light would be. So this would be dynamic zero, and this would be dynamic ten. And they'd all stand in a great big circle, and the, the softer it gets, they back up, the louder it gets, the closer they get. If they're standing still for more than two seconds, it's boring. Okay, so the goal is that every note you sing, right? Heart of my heart, not enough. Heart of my heart, I love. And making sure that the dynamics are in constant motion. We would do they have an idea of what the dynamics are before they start their exercise or were Typically, what I'll ask them to do right at the start, because um, it is, I'll, I'll ask them, just show me what you think it is. Because I think for the most part, music, if you, if you have a, an amateur sense of the tension and release, you'll kind of get, right, um, you, you'll kind of get where the climax of the song should be. So, um, no one's going to go somewhere over the rainbow. They're not, you know, you kind of understand the direction that it should be going. And it's better if they're doing a dynamic plan that they believe in than for me to say, here's what I want you to think the dynamic plan should be. Right? Now, if I notice that they all start backing off in a spot that I actually really want to start building, building to a climax, then we'll stop and we'll talk about it and we'll walk through the pattern and things like that. But generally, the first time that we do it, I kind of just want to know what their feel is for the overall song. So you play them the song first and then get them to move I would do all of this before we even learn, before we hand out the learning tracks. Yep. So I, I would play a learning track and say, almost as if it were a, a, a music appreciation class of a bunch of tiny children. You know, I'd say, okay, come on guys, stand in a circle, and I'm gonna play a song, and you dance around and show me how it feels. Like, I'm not that elementary with my, with my chorus, but it's essentially, I'm gonna play you a song, and I want you to stand where you think the, uh, the, the phrasing and the musical line should go. When you think it's building to a great big climax, right? Uh, I can forget you never from you I ne'er can sever say you'll be mine forever I love right to just get them and I'm I'm, I'm singing it now but I play them and see if they go say you'll be mine forever I mean if they're all doing that then they most of our choruses 
most of the choruses that, that performed uh, uh, was it yesterday or the, the day before, uh, I think, stood like this. Say you'll be mine for it. There was maybe two or three spots in a song where they got softer or two or three spots in a song where they really nailed it. But I think for the most part, if you were to map out their plan, they were standing there for 10 seconds at a time at the exact same dynamic. Were the notes and words right? Totally. They totally were right for the most part. Okay, but we can't get the score to go any higher because they're just not doing anything with it. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, oh, I'm totally out of time. And we got like 10 minutes left. So here's an example of how I, so then I start to analyze my music. This is an, an example of, of one of the songs that, that I do with the chorus and how I analyze it. So I'll walk you through this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just blast through this really quickly. Were any of you in the tune it or die class yeah. that I did? So I talked about the three most important intervals to barbershop singing. The first of which is the octave, because the bottom note needs to be loud. The bottom note always needs to be louder than the top note because of the overtone series. So what I will do is I will go through and I will put a bracket around all of the octaves. So that I know, for instance, heart of my heart. The first interval between the basses and the lead is an octave. If the lead just sings, hey, I've got the melody, so I'm going to sing whatever I want, that's not going to be as perfect as it could if the lead went, heart of my heart, to understand how those intervals should be balanced and tuned. So I know all of those. The next interval that I note is the perfect fit, because those intervals always have to be sung at equal volume. If you have a perfect fifth between the tenors and the baritones, and you have three tenors, but you have seven baritones, you have to understand how important that interval is to actually locking and ringing that chord. And the last interval that I put a circle around is the major second. Same thing, the major second has to be sung at equal volume for it to work uh, uh, correctly. Very often this, this happens between the lead and baritone. This is the interval that causes us to flat the most because that interval is a dissonant interval and then that bottom note tends to flat to make a more consonant interval and then this top note tries to meet that note again and we just do a race to who can flat the song the fastest. Um, then I go through and I mark two more things. I've got a big line wherever we're going to take the breaths. I tell the chorus before we start the song, there are 17 collective breaths in this song. And here is where all of them are. Here is the breath plan. The other thing that I do is I put a box around all of the phrase targets. So we go, you've gone away from me, your face I long to see. Breath, since you've been gone, it's not the same breath. Okay, so we know for the most, the reason these are important is because these are the ones that we really have to scrutinize the tuning and the intervals. If, right, if we go, you've gone away, right, that a uh chord is not as important as, from me your face I long to see. So we have to make sure, really when we get to some of these, Killer moments that if there's anything that has to be balanced or tuned correctly in it, that we're sure we're doing it. Now, this is all, I, I don't show this to my chorus, I don't show this to anyone, but this helps me be a master of the song. Once, once I do all of this, uh, 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 so this is, if you were in the tune it or die class, this is the song analysis that I was talking about. So if, um, if you have 100 notes in a song, a majority of those notes that you're singing are the tonic pitch. At least in this song that I was analyzing, 44% of the song, if it's in the key of C, 
44% of the notes were C. Okay, so we have to know when we're on C. So the other thing that we should go through our music and do is identify all of the tonic pitches and make sure that the people then understand when they're on the tonic pitch by either raising their hand where they're on it, hold the pitch pipe as a drone, all sorts of things like that. And the last thing that I do before giving this to the, to the chorus is I will come up with a scenario that is the page one of the PDF. Okay? Because it's not just a happy song. It's not a love song. How long do we have to go until love becomes boring? About eight seconds. How many words fall under the umbrella of love? Thousands. Okay, so we have to make sure that when we sing, we don't just sing love. Heart of my heart, I love you. Life would be not without you. Light of my Right? Love, love, love. We have to think, heart of my heart, I love you. Adoration. And then life would be not without you. Desperation. So that instead of love, 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 we get adoration. Heart of my heart, I love you. Desperation. Life would be not without you. Light of my life, my darling. Passion. Light of my life, so that you're creating every phrase that comes up is a different kind of characteristic of love, okay? So uh, the chorus gets a scenario. If we have, we kind of said this in the, in the first thing with the judges, if we have a young guy in the chorus who is, you know, has never had a relationship in his life, we have a 23 year old who just got engaged, 45 year old going through a divorce, and a 72-year-old who's, who's uh, having health problems or, or, right? or uh, you know, potentially losing or has lost a wife, you're going to get all of those different perspectives. So having a scenario about the song gives everyone something to latch onto and understand uh, the, the, the meaning of the song. Okay? Um, now, how many of you have singers in your chorus Choruses that don't read music. Okay, I think we find that to be true with almost all barbershop. How many of you have singers in your chorus who don't speak Russian? Okay, do you give them anything in Russian? I mean, except for performing a song in Russian, right? But I mean, how many of you write out the instructions to the song in Russian and expect them to understand it? Right? So if your singers don't read music, why the heck do you always give them sheet music? So what I give my singers, now that doesn't mean that I get rid of the music because I have singers that do, but I give another option if I have guys that don't read music. And this is it. This is the entire song on one sheet of music, on one sheet of paper. Okay? And it shows them where the breaths are by a slash. It shows them if I put a dash that there's a swipe. It shows them where the forward motion is going to be, the dynamic plan from one to 10. In parentheses, it tells them where there's octaves or unisons that they have to back off on. I underline places where I don't want them to breathe. I bold it if they're a different part than the leads and they all of a sudden take the melody. Um, italics, if there's secondary material, secondary material is when the leads are singing the melody and the basses are going boom, 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 where it's less important. Um, and CC, if they need to change the character, like we were just talking, heart of my heart, I love you, adoration, life would be not without you, desperation. This gives the chorus everything that they need to score 100 on one sheet of paper. But I can't do any one of those things if I don't analyze my music, right? So I, all of this happens, all of this has happened for about two months before I finally purchase the learning tracks and say, okay guys, we're gonna sing Blue Skies, right? Some of this, you have to go really in depth 
for a ballad, and then some of it you don't have to go as in depth. The first time I did this, it took me two months. Now, with a new song, it'll take me maybe a week if I work on it every day for, for an hour or two. So, that means you're doing a fair bit of teaching by road. No, then I, then I give them the learning track and we don't work on it until they have it learned. But, but there are some choruses who do teach, use the chorus rehearsal time to teach notes and words. And if you're that kind of a chorus, that's fine. Right? I, what works for my chorus would definitely not work for all of your choruses. So you have to understand your chorus culture, what your guys want. And if they want to, and, if, and you, if you and they want to spend time in rehearsal working on teaching and learning notes and words, and you're all cool with that, then that's perfectly fine. I'm not, my chorus isn't, but that doesn't mean that it's bad if you do. That just means that our choruses are different. So this is, you, you might have this, meet them, and uh, you're listening to it going through that. How are you working with them with this before they go? No, 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 uh, uh, I will develop this first. Yes. Then once they get the, the teach track, they uh, get this and they get this and they get the sheet music and they get all of these tools right. so that they're not, we're not layering things on top. We're not learning the notes and words, and then we're going to learn the dynamic plan. And oh, remember, don't breathe here, breathe here. And then remember, now here's the form of the song, and here's how we start. It's all done for them. My personal philosophy is that there are no bad choruses. There are only bad chorus directors. Right? And if your chorus is bad, it's probably bad because you didn't do enough preparation. Right? So I mean, understanding that your guys don't read, or some of your guys don't read music, even the ones who do read music, are going to find this ridiculously helpful because this has stuff that the sheet music will never have in it. So I mean, I can, I'll, we can go on a little bit, uh, 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 this is another thing that I do for my chorus, is that instead of giving them the sheet music, I just take excerpts of the sheet music that have the most difficult parts in it, and I tell them what they need to work on. Lord helps those two is exactly the same chords on the words and on judgment. They have to click into place, and no one can scoop or slide. If you don't know it, don't guess at it. He will receive you needs attention from all four parts. Amen, swipes need to be perfect. Right? And I just excerpt the sheet music and tell them exactly what needs to be worked on, and I do this for the entire repertoire. They, they have nothing to guess at. The problem is that my guys, for the most part, go home, they are well-meaning singers, but they just don't know what to work on. They go home and they have the sheet music and a learning track, and you know what they do? They sit in their car on the way to work and they listen to the learning track over and over and over again and think that that's gonna make them a better singer. So, I'll stop there because we're kind of out of time, does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Well, can I get that email? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let's see how we can do this. While I'm doing that, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah? Was your chorus always like that? Where you were just like, the expectation is that he learned notes and words? Yeah. How did you kind of get that from the expectation? That's a really, really good question. We sat down and we talked about it. The whole chorus, so you sat down and discussed what the expectation 
we sat down and we defined two things. We defined the, the vision, the, the mission of the chorus, which is who we are right now, and the vision of the chorus, who do we want to be in 10 years. And then we made sure that everyone in the chorus agreed on it. Okay? And it was extremely elaborate. It took us months. We, we took every single word in that sentence and said, does this word belong here? Do we all believe that we should be educating the community? Do we believe that we should be entertaining? You know, should we use the word entertaining or performing? Because what's the difference? Are we a barbershop group or are we an acapella group? Or are we a choral group? Okay? Uh, do we want to recruit young? I mean, we just went through every bit of it. And once we all agreed on it, we made sure that every single decision that we made, the time that we start our rehearsal, how we start our rehearsal, what if everyone doesn't show up on time? Do we wait? You know, all sorts of little things. And we created, those two things helped us to create chorus culture. But it wasn't something that came down from on high where I said, we all need to do this. We talked about it for months and eventually all agreed that this is who we are, this is who we want to be, and then to get from A to B, here are the things that we need to do. Does everyone agree? And then we did it every single week. And it, I've been with the chorus for 10 years. We went from 43 singers 10 years ago to 120. We went from scoring an 82 to scoring a 91. We went from 13th place to third place. But every year, we, we didn't go from an 82 to an 85. We went from an 82 to an 82.7. 82.7 to an 82.9. 82.9 to an 83.7. You know, just these baby steps in the right direction. So you think it's all about, you know, being the dictator. It's like, come on guys, you gotta get out back here. It's maybe a collaborative effort. And Absolutely. That's not the majority of you say yes, it's every single person. Has to be. So Joe, I listened to your harmony university keynote on YouTube and you non-competition side of things and doing a lot of gigs that uh, you know we're giving back to the community or giving back to the community at large you know, mm -hmm. outside of DC. Um, seems like it's like a wonderful little effort for all the for all the guys because if you, you went to France and uh, all this stuff didn't you like yeah. It's not difficult for them though when when they're doing things that no one else does. You know, we sing for the president every year in the White House. We've sung at Carnegie Hall seven times, which is I guess the equivalent of the Sydney Opera House. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have to say. Come on, guys, please, let's go sing for Obama. Please, let's go sing at the White House. Will you please, right? I say, we're going to go sing at the White House, and I can only take 20 of you. Right? I don't have any problems. Right? You know, so it's all about creating that interest, creating that demand. I'm sorry, I'm still looking for 